Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you're watching it, whatever time you're watching this. Welcome to another episode of Pages to Progress. We are finishing the book today, uh, the book that we have been going through, The Sonship of Christ. Not sure if you can see that well. The Sonship of Christ by Ty Gibson. Thanks, John. Um, and it's been a, an exciting book to go through. We are hitting chapter 17, right to the end of the book. Chapter, help me out, guys. Is it 20, 22? 21. 21, thank 21. you. Uh, I almost got it. Um, as usual, we have John, Joe, Darlene. Thanks very much for having this conversation with me. It's been a very, very interesting read. The whole book um, has been a very, very interesting read. And these particular chapters have been quite enthralling. Um, maybe we can go through it bit by bit. Let's start with the transcendence of God. Um, let's kick off there. Chapter 17, the transcendence of, of God. I guess... I guess the nature of this particular chapter was to try and show how vast and wide he is and how almost incomparable, am I saying the word right? Incomparable? Incomprehensible is what I want to say. <laughs> I think that's what I want to say. Incomprehensible he is in, in, in some respect. Um, but I, I think another thing about this particular chapter for me that was quite striking was just to echo again the whole idea that God's role was to, to, to mediate within humanity. Um, and in order to, and, and because he was able to do that, that's what makes the whole position of the son of God so profound because he wants to try and achieve a certain status that gives humanity an inheritance of something that was always always for them what did what did you guys think of of this particular chapter is it did anything stick out for you sure. i think because like you just said because he's so incomprehensible and but he at the same time wants to connect with us wants to communicate with us and wants to be known to us that he has throughout the you know the history in the bible that using the human language uh, the the way we understand our life the way we, who, who we are um using that like you know he used the example of him describing himself as a father mother a burning bush you know and so that we can find a way to try to understand to grasp who he is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. joe you wanted to add to that yeah, I think at the very beginning uh, of this chapter, there was this comparison between pantheism, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the biblical definition of, of, of where God is. And, and I think the pantheism definition is that God is present in all of creation, like he's, he, God is in that tree, God is in that shoe, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. versus the biblical idea is uh, of his omnipresence is that God is present to all of creation he is everywhere and then he kind of proceeds to say well if you kind of start to subtract creation away you strip away creation what's left you know when you take away everything that's out there material wise then you have really what's left is is god and god is you know the kind of he transcends everything that he made yet he's so high above that it's like you know we're a, a, an ant compared to who he is and yet, even though they were so far apart from his creation, you know, you know, because oftentimes I think pantheism, we try to bring God down to us, you know, you know, we try to put God in his creation, which is, I think that's why it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, he is that tree. He is, that, you know, no, no, God is, you know, he made the tree. And I think that uh, what's important for me was that he is so high above, yet how he, like what Darling was saying, he tries in so many different ways to kind of bring us to an, a better understanding of him. And I think mm. at the very end of this chapter, he would use the word mediation. And that one mediation is Christ. He, he bridges the gap, that's such mm -hmm. a huge gap. And then I think that's where uh, I think the, the gospel message is about. And, and even though he made the tree, the tree um, shows us an attribute of God in some respect, the, the, the person, the male, the female, the mother, the, the child, everything points back to an image of who he is an aspect of who he is should i say and the greatest image is us that is the the greatest image 
Um, anything to add, John, or, or, or maybe we'll move on? If you no, know. not much to add. I mean, he uses that big word transcendence, which I think everyone else described as he's above and beyond anything we can comprehend. It kind of ties this chapter 17 with chapter 19, where he gets into the omnipotence, omniscience, oh, and that was omnipresence. Exciting. That was exciting. We'll get um, to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like, I mean, they basically said the question on page 192 at the bottom of the page is if apart from all creation, all there is, is God, what or who is God? And then he pretty much answers it on the next page. And he says, God is love. God is absolute other centeredness, mm -hmm. which is what I'm struggling with a bit myself. And then the third part is stripped down to God's pure Godness. God is perfect relational bliss, which I don't like the word bliss. Um, and it, it, it's just, it's a little bit non nondescript for me, but I, I think I get the idea. And, and when you think about it, that bliss was ruined with sin mm -hmm. and it was through God's mediation that we're brought back into that relationship. Right. Well, I actually God, loved it. I actually you love loved the word bliss. I love that God is perfect relation of bliss. I mean, oh, right. I, it's just such a superficial word. I mean, no, it's bliss. not. <laughs> All no. right. No, it's not. <laughs> She's using her, her uh, right brain, John. There. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I think I have a right yeah. brain somewhere. But and, and you, left. Go, go on, Dave. <laughs> no, I, I only I say this because, to be really honest, I've been at, I've been on the receiving end of it. I've been on the receiving end of my marriage with Kosuke. and we're not. I'm not in any way saying that our marriage is perfect. He's perfect. I'm perfect. Not at all but I've had experiences of that perfect relational blissness where truly it's, it, is the, it is because of the fact that he is being other-centered, that he's mm -hmm. being me-centered, not himself. And re at being at that receiving end, this is exactly how you feel. That's what you experience. So this, this is a perfect segue to the next chapter, <laughs> the genius of three. The problem yeah, actually, chapter, the, the problem chapter for me. Um, <laughs> I, I struggled through, I'll be honest, I struggled through this chapter. I read this three times um, because I, I just needed to just, every, every time it was just like, what? No, that doesn't make sense, Ty. What do you mean? Um, so you struggled guess, with the minimum numeric value of love yes, being three? Yes. Or that there was a numeric minimum numeric value of love well first off i struggled with the idea that the minimum numer numerical value of, of relational um what's it bliss if you want to use the word Darlene, <laughs> is three um and and i get okay. why he's trying to explain it in the way that uh one constitutes a complete absence of otherness on page 198 two constitutes a state in which each is the exclusive center of other which is what I guess Darlene is kind of describing, but then three constitutes a state in which each one enjoys both being the center of attention and deferring the center of attention. I guess I, I, I don't have much to say apart from the fact of um, why can't the relational um, base of two be, be, be unselfish is, is my ultimate question. Why can't it be unselfish? Because I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, Ty Gibson is saying that if it's just about two people, it's selfishness. I think it's somewhat, I, I don't know that it's purely selfish. It's just limited and there is no choice in it because it's me or another there person. Is. You if choose to love your two. wife. She chooses to love you, no? And you can choose not to, but then if you choose not to, you're back to one which is, you know, the complete absence of otherness. And so yes. if you have, if I have two, then I have a choice. And, you know, I can go back to being one, you know, by ignoring those two, and I'm back to the, a complete absence of otherness. But ideally, you know, he's pushing for, you know, the numeric value of love. So if there's love involved, then I can choose to love one or the other or both. Um, but it gives a choice on top of um, the, the other two options. And, and maybe I'm I did struggle the, with that as well. Maybe I'm pushing the boat out too wild here, <clears throat> but let me uh, tell me what you think. And maybe I'm, maybe I have a completely different perspective because I'm speaking to three married people here and I'm the only one who's unmarried. 
but it's almost like I I could I'm throwing this back in Ty Gibson's face and say I'm saying all right fair enough you're saying the numerical um, um, e equilibrium of love is three so what's wrong with a polygamous relationship then between what what if I was to go and and court two women and marry two women so does does is that not perfect is does that not I I don't know if I'm pushing the boat out too far here but oh, I, I, I that crossed my mind so definitely right because I I <laughs> feel like if that's the very I get it he sees the patterns in science and quarks and bosons and all of that kind of stuff I, I get it you can see that he's almost signature of this triune god in different aspects but but I also do understand the elements of the idea that he just has an innate desire to take the attention of himself as a god and love humanity and he kind of wants to pass that on to humanity as well I think I, I don't know if I'm going to be well that's myself. so that middle paragraph on page 199 it says so three persons can experience giving love receiving love and expanding love to the level of third party inclusion right. and I think I, that kind of explains the one two and three of it you know as one person, you know, you're kind of, there's no one else. You could potentially, you know, give love, but to who, if there's two people, then you can not only give, but you can receive. But when there's that third person, it expands. And I, and I, I think and that's, a minimum, that's a minimum number. So that expansion can expand to, you know, mm -hmm. infinity. And, and that's what God is. He's, he loves each of us and every one of us deeply and equally, you know, so, to its maximum. So that, what you just said was expanded when he started thinking about, when he gave the example of him and his children. Right. And, and that, that really, I think it, I, I got his point then because it was just like, first it was him and his wife. Fair enough, they pour into each other, but then their child comes along and now you have two people pouring into the other. And I do get that. I, and maybe, maybe that's a perspective that didn't come as natural to me because I'm not married and I don't have children. And I don't, well, I don't see that dynamic, I guess. And I think when you say polygamy, it implies a type of love. And my question would be, he doesn't really get into the different types of love. He just no, he says doesn't. love, and it's kind of an all-inclusive love, yeah. um, which is interesting, and, and it's okay. Joe? But I, so, yeah, I, I think uh, in uh, my page, it's location 1755. Um, I guess it's, it's where he kind of kind of differentiates the the one two and three you know he's and he's talking about the the two right he says if two people love each other and they're exclusively loving each other uh, then it's just exclusive they love each other they really don't it, it doesn't go outside of themselves and that's why all of a sudden if you have a third person the third paragraph it says three constitutes a state in which one enjoys both being the center of attention and deferring the center of attention so it's the added of deferring it's, right it's the deference yeah it's, it's it's what's the key and i think i was looking back and you know and like you said when i got married it's like oh you, you're you're cloud nine you love each other you do everything for each other and all of a sudden everyone else outside you just starts to disappear and of course you know once you have a child it becomes like oh okay now you've got this little child you've got to love and 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 all of a sudden it adds the kind of dimension that I think that's why Enoch said, you know, when he was walking with God, it wasn't until he had that child that he began to understand God's love, perhaps. That's interesting. I've never looked at it in that point of view before. That's interesting. So, so yeah, I guess we, you know, we're kind of splitting here as far as because I, I kind of, like you guys, kind of struggled in one sense because maybe he went a little too far in the sense that he really was trying to differentiate why you have to have a three triune God. And I think one of his arguments was to, to defend the, the Trinity view versus the, mm -hmm. uh, the anti-Trinity view. Anti-Trinitarian view. So that if, you, if, you, if, you, if you understand that Jesus came later, that means you kind of have to conclude that, G, that God was by himself, all by himself before Jesus came along. And then he says, if that was the case, then God is not love. And that was a jump that I didn't quite like him saying because, because there's a lot of people out there who believe in the, in the anti trinitarian view who believe that God is love. But to say that if you believe in that view and if you do, then that means that God is not love. He, he can't yeah, I, I was uncomfortable with that too. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was just was, really harsh. Was this the chapter, remind me, was this the chapter where he made 
he really tried to make the emphasis on the three distinct beings of God. No, that comes a little bit later. No, later. Okay, because that was something else that always also made me a bit uncomfortable. This is which, the chapter. Is, this is the chapter where he threw in that Affirmov state. Right, right. And the, the dolls, the nesting yeah. dolls, the Russian dolls. Which I don't know. That didn't help me. I guess I had a little bit of a problem with three um, being the number, but um, I also kind of didn't mind the Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, to the galaxy having the machine that calculates the meaning of life come out to i think it was 52 if i remember right <laughs> it was just kind of random and arbitrary and so this was better than that and i just kind of accepted it <laughs> yeah that, yeah okay i mean he he's allowed to come up with his arguments no problem so it's just, <laughs> I, I don't think it's a salvific thing yeah, um, is, you know in his creative ability you know it, it's more i think an attribute to his creativity and how he creates things yes well yeah, yeah. and i think uh, you know there's there's power in the number seven or 12 or you know i mean there's certain mm -hmm. numbers that have certain kind of you know you could you think well why is there's what's a cycle of you know 12 right what's the seven days you know why is the the, the world turn on its axis a certain way so mm -hmm. I think there's a certain, but it's kind of interesting though how if god was to be the mastermind of creation and there has mm -hmm. to be some sort of uh like meaning behind it you know as opposed to maybe evolution which is an idea of just randomness things colliding and exploding just happen chance that we are born that takes god out of the picture i think if you look at the universe and if you look at the science the, the, the scientists are proving themselves that, hey, there's a there's a master creator in mind, right, uh, who created everything that was logical. And I think to me, that just explains more that there has to be a creation, creator as opposed to their, their belief of, of, uh, of evolution. So let me, so let, want... me not, let me not throw him entirely under the bus. Sorry, John. Okay, I want to hear what you have to say, because I was just going to be the devil's advocate on the whole thing. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, you know, if the minimum number is three, and there's God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. You could almost argue that God didn't need creation, didn't need humanity. Well, this is, yeah, no, this is exactly it. <laughs> um, and I think that's when you get, that's the problem you run into when you get into numbers and too deep into meanings with numbers. Or and I think he's just making an argument a for the Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> But um, I, I know that Ty Gibson has another book where he dedicates all of this to that, which I haven't read, so I can't really comment too much on, on, on his thoughts. But let's, let's try to steer the ship a, a bit closer to the next chapter as we move on. Why did he talk about all of this? I think, I think one of the natures of, of to what his arguments were was to build an argument based upon the idea that we have a fully relational God who essentially because of humanity, an essence of him gets torn away to save humanity. And that, I think that's one of the things that he wanted to try and articulate. Like there's a piece of God that gets ripped away from him um, momentarily in order to save, save humanity, which leads us on to the, the next chapter, um, the cutting, uh, the cutting deep in into god d did you have any thoughts on this particular chapter did anything strike out as quite meaningful to you uh i think the whole description of the cutting away of the god the three the trinity but it's actually literally cut away and to the point where not only yes death but the fact that it was going to be uh eternal cutting away right and for God to, for Christ to go through that was, again, is just really unbelievable love. And, you know, it, it, as I was reading this, <laughs> I used to think, you know, there's uh, in the Bible where he says, if your eyes sin, pluck it out, right? Or if your hands are sins, cut it off. And I used to think that, oh, my goodness, this is such an outrageous <laughs> thing, you know, telling us to do that. Uh, but in the light of the fact that Christ did literally had to cut himself away uh, from that relationship to the point of, you know, of no return, that for God to ask us to do that, when if we are eyes sin, pluck it out, I just, I felt like after reading this, geez, you know, that's, that's not outrageous. That's not an outrageous suggestion, <laughs> you know, in the light of what, what Christ did for us. So. Mm definitely quite powerful anyone else who wants yeah. to 
comment on this chapter? No, I actually liked this chapter the best. Uh, well, the least, whole book? Me too. Well, maybe, well, not the whole book. But. Yeah, those couple of things, but you know, this is where it all boils down to, right? It, 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 it's, it's, you know, the, the building up of God is, you know, the omnipotence and omniscience and just the higher above. And he didn't have to, right? Yet he, he came to the situation. And again, the, I think the whole book is, you know, why the sonship, why, why the definition of the sonship of God, of Jesus, right? Why is he called the son of God? Um, and I see that he made a promise to Abraham. I remember what the premise, promise was that, you know, he's not just going to give him more children like the stars of the sky. There was a the hidden promise. The hidden promise was to Ab Abraham. Yes, you're going to have, you're, in your old age, you're going to have a child. But that child down the line is going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the Redeemer that saves all of humanity. And, and a Abraham knew that. It's not that he didn't. And it was a promise because he was a prophet too, right? He was given a foreshadow of the future and he was given a picture of Jesus to come. That's why the, the whole, uh, you know, uh, who gets the, uh, um, you know, uh, the promise uh, is, was so important. And so to me, when God makes a promise to Abraham and says, I'll give you these children and that one of them will be the Messiah, the savior of the world. And Abraham goes, how, how do you, how, how do I, show, how am I sure that you're going to do this? And God says, I'll show you. And he literally makes a pact a human pact right it was common in those days that if you take an animal you cut it in half and you step between it it was more like you know hey i'm putting my life online i will be like that animal split asunder if i don't do what i do mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's like god telling abraham i will do this and i will put my life on the line and in fact mm -hmm. it will be his life that gets torn apart like the like darling was saying and and at the ultimately it says you know he he uh he confirms the covenant. He confirms mm -hmm. a promise when Jesus was on the cross, finally being ripped apart. And we'll, I'm sure we're going to go into this, and I don't want to take all the time, but that to me was is, is powerful imagery of God himself saying, I will make a promise to you, Abraham. I will make it happen. I will send mm -hmm. my own son. I will send myself, and I will split myself apart like these three. And it was interesting. He asked him to do three animals. He cut three animals in half, and those three represented the Godhead. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it was interesting here that, yes, Jesus was the one that was ultimately cut. But if we follow the argument that, you know, there's three in one, all three of them were actually cut in half. And it was just, it was a powerful image. I never heard it before. And that, to me, was why I think I, I got a blessing from this chapter. Mm -hmm. John, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with what Joe's saying. Um, there, it, It's an interesting... Got interesting thing that God did. He used a very human process to um, bind himself to his promise. Um, and then I read, read through the chapter and it's kind of like, well, but he did keep his promise. He did do what he said. Right. And so, and so then I was a little bit con conflicted because it's like, why did he have to be, you know, torn apart? But then at the same time, he represented humanity that didn't do what it said. Right, right. And, and so he did have to be torn apart. And then, and then there's that concept that he was torn out of the Trinity. Um, and in some ways he was, but he voluntarily came. I mean, the tearing apart out of the Trinity happened when he came down with the incarnation in my, in, yes. in my thoughts. Um, and then the death ultimately uh, I'm still struggling with a bit. I mean, it, it was, he did die for our sins. Mm -hmm. And so was it sin that killed him or was it the separation from God that killed him? Um, it's still something that I'm, I'm struggling with a bit. And then obviously he now represents humanity and he is separated from God. And I do believe that God, the father and God, the Holy spirit suffered, um, equally, but I'm not sure if they suffered in the same way. And ultimately, at least in my view, it, if this God, the son, the son of God still represents humanity, it seems like he is still somewhat removed from the Trinity. But well, at I, the same time, he's still fully God. So that's the part I still struggle with a bit. Well, I, I can understand why you struggle with this. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll mention this. This was one of the most really powerful parts um that really just got me going is when he when he built the whole idea of kenosis mm -hmm. um kenosis that 
the, the kind of separation that God went or, but the English standard version calls it emptied himself. And it's that mm -hmm. famous text in Philippians chapter two, five to 11, let this mind be with you, be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. And then it, it goes on to say, but God made himself of no reputation, kenosis, or, em or the idea of emptying. Um, and I, and then when he ev eventually talks about, so what is it that Christ emptied of? Well, he emptied of omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. And I had to ha really have a hard think about that. What does it yeah. take to empty yourself? Well, it takes an omnipotent being to be a dependent to become dependent it takes an omniscient being to become dependent it takes an omnipresent being to, to become dependent he emptied his power completely so that would constitute an ultimate separation from a trinity in terms of power john in answer to the yeah. first one of first of one of your points but then his death on the cross ultimately is the nail in the head no pun intended with him essentially not only being powerless or choosing to be powerless let's just be very clear because he, mm -hmm. he wasn't he could have just clipped his fingers and an old army of angels could have come um but to be voluntarily separated uh from the idea of communing with god in that moment because the silence that he received from the father and the spirit is synonymous to the silences we receive when our sin separates us from God. Yes. And that, that to me was incredibly profound to think that a God, an ultimately powerful um, and ultimately all knowing and ultimately uh, he is everywhere. God decides I'm going to be none of those things just so that I can save humanity you you asked the question um previously um it's like well he didn't need to cut himself you're right um mm -hmm. but he did it because of us because he didn't want us to cut ourselves and so he decided to cut him himself so i i don't know if that answers your question or at least speaks to some of the points that you mentioned i do think he was separated on the in the incarnation <laughs> but i think the death completely mm -hmm. severed a relationship because and represents represented that severed relationship of what sin does in terms of the consequences of humanity if, if i made any sense whatsoever no no mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense to me so yeah so i i thought that was pretty powerful i don't i can't say i've i fully thought about that idea much before the concept of him emptying his power but nice. i i really loved it I really love the idea that he, he does that. Um, and on page 221, um, he, Paul, he, he, he yes. responds to Paul and he says, by stepping down from his position, Jesus, obviously, by stepping down from his position of equality with God, becoming a member of the human race, voluntarily emptying himself of his divine powers and living in obedience to the covenant of love to the point of death, which we talk about um, what, what, the whole, what Abraham, uh, the covenant he made with Abraham and the whole cut and everything. The position of rightful lordship over the world that was lost by Adam was regained in Christ. Through him, we are made by sons. We are made sons of God once more. And the world is brought back under human stewardship. Once again, God won humanity as a human, not as a God. Um, and that, that to me is, is one of the most amazing things. So there's a um, sentence here that made it just, you know, um, kind of interesting for me to hear. You said, you know, when, the, when Christ on the cross, you know, like you said, um, separated, you know, we, that we, we were as Adventists, we, we call that the, the second death, right? You know, mm -hmm. it was not just a physical death that he, he suffered, but it was a second death, that se internal separation from God when he took on the sins of the whole world. And then he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? Mm -hmm. and that was that eternal separation that he experienced for all of mankind, if we, you know, accept his gift. And it says here, hang in there alone, God alone, without God, for the first time ever in all eternity. Uh, mm -hmm. We are face to face with a God who literally loves all others above and before himself. 
and that one colossal act of perfect relational fidelity, Christ confirmed the covenant, that covenant he made to Abraham. And uh, it, it's mind-boggling to think that God is, you know, alone without God, because, <laughs> you know, the whole yeah. understanding, but it, it's ultimately what happened, right? And it's mm -hmm. interesting that, yes, he, he was cut off, and that's why you know, he mentioned also Daniel kind of talking in prophetic language that he was going to be cut off, and he did that on the cross. Um, but he did that in order to redeem us back. And it says, for the first time, God's nature, which was God, you know, he left all alone to, to pick up man's humanity nature. And then at the end of it all, he invites us to be the brother, to be part of that trinity. And so it's, just, it's interesting now that three almost became four. So mm -hmm. we're adding that picture. So it's, yeah. it's amazing how we can be participating in that yeah. love triangle. Don't, don't, don't tell Ty Gibson that, Joe. He, he won't like that. Um, um, but anyway, <laughs> our, last, our last few chapters, uh, the enforcer and basically the conclusion. Um, there was something that really stuck out for me. I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys the opportunity to to talk first. Um, um, what, what, what do you think, guys? The last two chapters. Anything that was striking for you? So actually, this the unforcer chapter mm. is the chapter I liked. Um, I mean, they talked about the body and the spirit earlier on in the chapter, and that made sense to me. And it's something I've heard before. But what came into focus was starting on page 240, where he talks about, he initially talks about Christ's job in the salvation enterprise. This is on page 239. Christ's job in the salvation enterprise was to come into our world and make this covenant sacrifice. And that is to prove by his death that God's love is faithful, even in the face of our sins. Mm. So the covenant was confirmed by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Mm -hmm. um, but then the next page, 240, it says the Holy Spirit then proceeds to take up the task of testifying to us of the covenant sacrifice and to work within us to make its application to our lives. And this is all coming out of Hebrews 10. Mm -hmm. That I hadn't, the, the Holy Spirit I've understood is what Christ left with us when he, you know, left this earth with the ascension to join God the Father on his right hand. Um, but I hadn't made that connection of the Holy Spirit testifying to us. And I think leading us to testify to others would be a very natural assumption. And I really like that. I mean, he spends a good couple pages on the Holy Spirit. Um, and actually, he spends the rest of this chapter talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and on page 244, it's Jesus repeatedly stated that his mission was to point to the Father. And you see that all throughout the book of John in particular. The mission of the Holy Spirit is to point towards Jesus. Well, that obviously makes sense. Uh, but then the Father points to Jesus and the three of them form this ceaseless circle of humble, self-deferring love toward one another. But also, you know, the, the Holy Spirit's working through us to draw us into that circle. Uh, and I, it's just... It was something I hadn't thought about, and, and it was something new to me, and, and I liked it. Did you want to add to that? You, are you talking to me? Yeah, did you want to add to that? Oh. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this chapter as well, uh, especially on the Holy Spirit's work. And um, I, truly... Um, we, we need the Holy Spirit in our heart to, um, to be at a place of uh, voluntarily giving our love and our life to God. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's when we do that, that's when we experience the true freedom. And, and I, I understand, I truly understand why uh, in the previous chapters where he talked about um, the God's kingdom of how, how it was not supposed to be governed by a king or any ruler. It was supposed to be completely based on, um, on uh, our voluntary love for God. And in that, when we have the God's law written in our heart, um, that 
all of us being in that place where we put others first before mm -hmm. ourselves, then we are naturally uh, governed or li we live our life in a way that uh, eliminates any strife in our life. Mm -hmm. And um, um, and I, I think that you know, you talked about in the previous, you know, few pages back, you talked about how uh, the um, church is the new community of the covenant where we're supposed to reflect this community or, or the covenant. And, and I wrote down the question of, you know, then how as a church, um, how do we reflect God within our church, you know, and how, whether it's through, um, our worship service or any of the ministries that we engage in, you know, how, how do we do this? You know, this is a, you know, I think that ever since we started this journey of pages to progress and we've been reading several books, it's been a question that's been constantly on my mind, you know, how is a church? Yeah, application yeah. part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that question still remains. And I think this whole chapter of the, uh, un, the unforcer, how God truly, um, through the work of the Holy Spirit leads us to a place of us voluntarily giving him that love and, and how that we can study that to, uh, to bring others to Christ, how, how we should be in, when we interact with others to reflect that love. Yeah. So uh, off the back of what you're saying, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go back to page 237, which one, I'll talk about what, was quite impactful for me and two hopefully we'll try and speak to some of the things you're talking about the um to top of 237 um he builds the argument of what constitutes a human being and he specifically talks about the idea that the breath of life is something on page 236 brings individuality identity and it's preserved for a resurrection when that removes from a person but on page 237 I love these words. He said, uh, the human being is by design a habitable creature. Um, and the Holy Spirit is the inhabitant we were created to host. I love that. It's beautiful mm -hmm. because, well, first of all, it highlights something incredibly important. He says it later on. I can't remember. He says a human being cannot be vacant. Mm -hmm. You either have the Holy Spirit or you either have another spirit because just by virtue of how you are created, there is a there is a space fit for something else to exist within you, and that that it fits so perfectly into the puzzle piece of the Holy Spirit. God was always meant to dwell with humanity from from the very beginning, and I thought that was such a beautiful picture of of this whole idea of habitation as opposed to possession mm -hmm. which are two different things mm -hmm. um and and i think we've done a, we've shot ourselves in the foot because we've never really we've used the word possession or at least uncomfortably used the word possession because of what it carried but i actually think habitation has a much more unforcing no pun intended from the chapter much more unforcing connotation to really hit um, and this really blew my mind when he uh, unveiled 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It makes total sense to me right now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why you would have so much liberty if you have mm -hmm. your missing puzzle piece, which is which is there, connected to you. Um, now, in answer to your, your statement or comment, um, D, about application, I think many a times we as Christians fail to have quality application because we just don't we haven't fully got the missing puzzle piece that's connected mm -hmm. in our lives and 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 it's um it's an annoying answer to the question and it seems almost cliche to say in order for um appropriate application to take place appropriate connection to the spirit needs to be okay. there okay. and i think that i think i hands up i am not as connected to the holy spirit as i need to be I, I accept some of his puzzle pieces, not all, because the Holy Spirit fused with a human being solves 
all the problems that a human being has. And, and I think that this is both for individual and the church. This is truly what it means to live a spirit led life. And I think that it was mind blowing to me why when we then talk about the function of the Holy Spirit as a witnesser of who Jesus is and what that actually and the implications of what that means to my life. It means that in every instance, Jesus's sacrifice becomes a witness to 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 which grocery shop I go to, to to whom I marry, to which car I'm going to buy. Am I going to go for the 27 inch or the 21st one inch monitor? Like he becomes a he becomes a, a lit. All of my life choices go into the context of the fact that Jesus has paid his 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 blood for me, and therefore my life just becomes. Uh, um, uh, just in a in a posture towards giving him glory in all sense. If I don't know if I'm being too airy well, that, in my words. That makes sense. And, and the reality is that the choices you make in your life and the things that you do are a witness to others. And that is a or that should be, I shouldn't say, because we do live in a world of sin. That should be a godly thing as well. Right. But I struggle with the same thing D did. And it's like, what does that look like? And I think that's where this last chapter does help us. He mentions on page 137, um, you know, that Pharaoh saw Joseph as a man in whom is the spirit of God. But I was looking for 237. Yeah, 237. Sorry. I was looking for, because he kind of went through just blow by blow, almost the whole Old Testament going into the New Testament. That starts on page 256, which is the covenant story. And we talked about earlier how this is kind of a summary. But I think it's important because... I don't like the idea that we, uh, we need to follow Jesus's example, but there's no way we can all be Jesus. And I think that's a bar that is often too high for any of us to reach. I don't believe that we are. I don't believe that Jesus is our example, John. Right. But you look at he's the people. God. No, well, I think he's an example of what God's love is and how we were meant to live here on earth is what I meant by that. Okay. Carry on. But, in, but then, so I need examples that are on the same level as I am, you know, mm -hmm. sinners born in this world of sin. Mm -hmm. And he starts with Adam, obviously not born in this world of sin on page 256. But then he hits, you know, Noah, he leaves out, you know, among others. And then he talks about Abraham. He talks about Isaac. He talks about Jacob. I mean, these are all chapters we've discussed, you know, the 12 becoming a corporate, you know, covenant. And then the kings, King David, King Solomon. And these are all people that were as different in the way they looked and the way they acted, as different in their backgrounds as we are today. But the thing that was common with them is that they all had a God that they continued to turn to, no matter their mm. successes, no matter their failings. Mm -hmm. And God worked through them with his spirit and they allowed him to work through them with his spirit. And I think that's ultimately what Ty Gibson's getting at is there's this story and it mm -hmm. contains two books, an Old Testament and a New Testament, but it's something we can apply to our lives even now. But we have this book, we can look and see how these people acted. They lived with other people in their community. They interacted with other people in their community. And that's how, you know, the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit worked through them. And they, and and often there's so much pressure on, you know, I'm going to screw this up, but no, my, my job is to testify or tell my story, you know, in the best way possible in the situations that I'm given at that mm -hmm. point, it gets passed over to the Holy spirit and he will work through me. He will work through whoever I'm talking to. And ultimately that's the power behind, behind all these stories, including my story. I like that. I like that. Um, I think that leads us into our final thoughts and final final i guess ideas on the whole book joe do you have anything that you walk away with i guess from this reading sure. um when you look at the i think the the title the sonship of christ you know to me it was important how you know uh ty didn't take just one chapter and try to prove a point he actually stepped back and said what does the entire book 
the Bible will tell us. And it's a story from beginning to the end. And he did that in previous chapters in describing about the sonship that John just kind of talked about and, and how that terminology came to being and how we need to take uh, the, the right definition of the sonship of God and Jesus. And then at the very end, I think uh, we see how it was uh, um, confirmed with Jesus on the cross. And then finally, it comes you know, because on the cross he could have he could have just finished there and said everything's all done and the whole universe would say ah oh, yeah we know right from wrong Satan what he did and we know not the true character of God and he's loving, but what he did was he took it a step further now and that's when I think the the story of uh, this chapter of the Enforcer the Holy Spirit John you're right brings it on board and says now we're going to fi finish the last last laugh you know take it home now and he then says we now need the work of the holy spirit to work on people like us to invite mm -hmm. us to participate in this final chapter of what god did and participate in this uh, final work of gathering people and he does it not through forcing like i said pastor but uh, unforcing by the wooing and the witnessing mm -hmm. and i think ultimately that's kind of like where it ends for me that I see how the, it's kind of the final picture is we are now invited to this picture of the sonship. We are invited to be the son of God that Adam couldn't do, but Jesus did for us to become part of his, you know, um, lineage. And I think if, and how we do that is asking Jesus um, to come to our heart through the Holy spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. And if, if it says here uh, concerning the revelation of God's faithful love given to the world in Christ, the Holy Spirit's job is to testify to that sacrifice or to magnify God's love in our understanding. So that's the Holy Spirit's job. And so if we understand that, then we can then, in our community, like Dee and John were saying, reach out to those around us and invite them to the fellowship and then in heaven one day. Amen. Amen. Dee, any, any final thoughts you want to add? Uh, yeah, I think just to wrap it up, it's uh, truly, I, I think just reading through this book, now I have truly like the very clear understanding of that the fact that Christ did truly come as a human that yes he was still God but he did not use his power for his own sake you know he completely lived a life of other centeredness and he has demonstrated that for us and you know he came into the he left his glory um, and and being in that perfect relation, loving relationship and came to a world that was just completely opposite of who he is and, and, and his world. And um, he truly lived out a life of a complete surrender and uh, dependence on God. And I think there's uh, definitely that there's a lot to learn from that. And, and the fact that he continues to call us his brother and his sister mm -hmm. and to continuously invite us to share in his throne and the fact that he is in heaven um, advocating for us. And, and, and I think the lastly that he is truly living up to his name of Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, it's, I'm very, very thankful. Yeah. Amen. Did you have anything, John, you wanted to add? No. Okay. I, this was a good read. Uh, and I agree with what Dee said. It, it, it solidified Jesus and what he was. He was human. He mm -hmm. was God. Um, and above all, he was love um, and mm -hmm. totally dependent on his father, which is what he showed us first and foremost that it's possible. And, and then he also showed us that that's the way it was meant to be. And everyone's life would be a lot better to try to, mm -hmm. to, to continue to do that. I'm just going to read one final quote from mm -hmm. Ty on page 260. To me, this was so profound, it summed up everything and how amazing it was for me right at the bottom. <clears throat> in becoming the son of God, God bent reality itself, his reality, to meet us in our need. And I, I thought that was beautiful. I, I, I really do. I, I, and and it's, been a, it's an amazing journey that we've managed to rediscover. I guess the mission of Jesus Christ to humanity and how that impacts us is going to be the testimony that passes on to others. And it's up to us to keep that legacy going in, in different ways. Guys, I really just want to thank you so much for journeying with me, John, Joe, and, and Dee. It's been awesome to, to go through with you on this book. I, I'm, I'm going to pray.
And then after I pray, we're going to just spend just a very short moment telling you about the next book that we're going to dive in. So let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you give us this opportunity to dis- rediscover the sonship of Christ. We wanna, we're so grateful for the ministry of Ty Gibson and what he's given to us. Um, and I pray that that interacts with our faith in different ways. I, pray your, I really do pray that your Holy Spirit can continue to be a witness to you, Lord, to us. Guide us and keep us as we continue this journey together in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank all those online who've journeyed with us on, on Pages to Progress. We are going to start a brand new book. Um, can someone th- um, show the book for me, please? The book is entitled The Apocalyptic Vision and the Neutering of Adventism <laughs> by George <laughs> Knight. Um, it's certainly going to be a book that's going to bring up a, a few ums and ahs and here's and there. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to have that dialogue. If you'd like to journey with us, just jump online and buy the book. And you, if you're like me and you like physical pages and you can't stand reading things off screen, then buy the book. But if you're like Joe, Joe and you can read it off a screen, then where can you get it, Joe? You can buy it on the Amazon. There and you go. Just, you can you download it any a media form you want there you go you get it much quicker that way but um we'd love for you to join the journey with us as we delve into that book uh six or seven chapters is it six six, six chapters. chapters okay so not not as as hefty as some of the other reads no, but we're going to reconvene next week next week we're going to be diving into chapter one of that book by george knight and we are inviting you to the table to that discussion with us but for now this is us saying a good evening because it's evening for us And a happy Sabbath for us, at least. Until next time. God bless you. Bye.